Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Tracy Cook and I'm with SACS Healthcare Communications. Before I introduce our moderator and speakers, on behalf of Stryker and SACS Communications, we want to thank all the frontline workers in our audience for your commitment and passion in helping us all through this very difficult time. We are truly indebted to you all. Before I introduce our moder moderator, James Simmons, and our speakers, Nicole Kupchuk and Andrew McCoy, I would like to show our audience how to ask questions and to send their comments. You can type your questions and comments directly into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Our moderator for today is James Simmons. Dr. Simmons is currently an acute care nurse practitioner at UCLA Ronald Reagan Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. He is a guest lecturer at UCLA School of Nursing Master's Entry Clinical Nurse Program. He is an adjunct lecturer Acute Care Nurse Practitioner Program, U University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing. He is a co-host of Drop the Subject, a nationally syndicated talk radio program on radio.com and is featured as a healthcare expert on numerous television, radio, podcasts, and social media programming. James, welcome. Good morning, everyone. And uh, Tracy, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. So the title of today's webinar is The Latest in Airway Management During Resuscitation. Speaking today on this very timely and very important topic are two amazing speakers, I promise you, Nicole Kupchik and Andrew McCoy. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for more than 20 years. About 20 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a change that spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Very important. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on this topic. And in 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchak Consulting and Education. Welcome, Nicole. Our second speaker, Andrew McCoy. Dr. McCoy is attending physician, Emergency Medicine, University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. He's also the medical director of the American Medical Response in Puget Sound, associate medical director of Seattle Fire Department, and medical director at Shoreline Medic One in Shoreline, Washington. Dr. McCoy serves as an international editorial board member of the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. He has published in numerous peer-reviewed journals and has presented at several national and international conferences. Dr. McCoy, welcome. So disclosures, of course, we have to let everybody know about these. Dr. McCoy has no disclosures. Ms. Kupchak has disclosed the following relationships. She's part of the Speakers Bureau with Stryker and Baxter Healthcare. She's also a consultant for Baxter Healthcare. Good news, everyone gets continuing education. Well, I should say nurses, EMS, and respiratory therapists get continuing education with this. So this act educational activity is approved for one contact hour, and a link to obtain those CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar, so stay tuned for that. Of course, we have to thank Stryker for their support of this educational activity. All right. All the particulars are out of the way. We are very excited now. I turn this presentation over to you, Nicole. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm really excited. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm super excited to uh, partner with Dr. Andy McCoy to discuss the latest in airway management during resuscitation. So let's get started. All right, so learning objectives for this session is we're gonna, um, many of you may realize that the new American Heart Association guidelines were just released. I think, gosh, I think it was almost exactly a month ago. And we're gonna talk about recently published trials on the latest in airway management. One of the things to keep in mind for those of you who work in the hospital is that a lot of the research that is done is performed in the pre-hospital setting. So always kind of keep that in mind and ask yourself, like, how would my environment be a little bit different from the, from the pre-hospital setting? And then we're going to talk about some techniques to enhance that first pass um, airway success and then talk about the role of post-arrest review to improve airway management. And I have to... I'll, 
I'm just going to warn you, we have some really interesting cases uh, yeah. to to review um, that uh, uh, are it's a little bit mind blowing. And what's going to happen is during this session is Dr. McCoy and I are going to kind of ping pong back and forth and hopefully make this a little more just conversational versus lecture type. So, all right. So what's happening in 2020? Well, the biggest thing um, in resuscitation is that we had kind of an overhaul of the guidelines. And this is the algorithm for the adult um, just uh, the adult pulseless uh, for the uh, geared toward the adult pulseless patient. And w one thing I want to point out is that um, there is kind of a bigger emphasis to give epinephrine early in non shockable rhythms. Now, in shockable rhythms, um, epinephrine should be administered after you've had failed uh, defibrillation attempts, but in the non shockable patient, uh, earlier epi was recommended. I have to be honest, like other than that, there were not any big mind blowing changes. I mean, Dr. McCoy, is there anything no, you would add? No, I totally agree. I think this is a really important, you're highlighting a really, really important point, right? Is it right up front when somebody arrests, we got to figure out, are we shockable? Are we not? And we got to treat right away. If we're not shockable, we're going to give that epi. If we're shockable, we're going to shock them, right? And that's the thing. That's what I want if I have a cardiac arrest. And I think that's what all of our audience would want. And and that's sort of where we where we are with the, the state of science today. So uh, not at, no huge earth shattering changes in these guidelines. A lot of work by a lot of really good people to try to put out a product that reflects the latest in the science. And that's some of what we're going to go through. Yeah, and then um, many of you might be aware that I have to say, like, kudos to the American Heart Association, but back in April 2020, I mean, if you think about when we really started kind of seeing, uh, you know, kind of uh, admissions for COVID in eight, April 2020, they put out um, guidelines for resuscitation for confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patients. And the one thing I think Dr. McCoy and I completely 100% agree on this is in a pandemic, there is no such thing as emergency. You protect yeah. yourself first. Yep. And we are finding that healthcare providers are contracting COVID at disproportional rates to the general public. And so you've got to protect yourself first, and especially in um, aerosol generating procedures. So some other things I just wanted to point out is, um, you know, a lot of these patients are arresting for hypoxia and uh, respiratory uh, to compromise. So just really ensure that you're using filters. I have actually have a picture I'm going to show you of a, like how to set up a filter with an AMBU bag and a bag valve mask. Um, you know, so anytime you can have filters ready at the bedside. Um, you can also consider a video laryngoscopy when placing airways, but just please, please, please make sure you are protected if you are in an event where you are placing an advanced airway in a patient who's got suspected or confirmed COVID. So this is what it looks like. Um, I, we could just kind of set these up in a um, training situation, but you can see we've got an endotracheal tube with a viral filter connected to the ventilator on the right over here. And then on the left, this is an example of a bag valve mask with a viral filter and um, an AMBU bag uh, mask and a viral filter. Um, so Dr. McCoy, are, in yeah. EMS, are your yeah. providers yep. doing this? Absolutely. From day yeah. one, we, you know, we had a, a stock of these and we bought more because they were really, uh, really critical in our effort to protect providers. And just to be clear, these are to protect providers, right? This doesn't protect the patient from you. This protects you from the exhalations of the patient and the viral particles or bacterial particles that they might contain. So these are really using these products is something that protects you uh, and, and minimizes your chance of aerosolizing uh, any sort of droplets and, and, uh, and helping to control uh, any spread of, of virus or bacterial infection that could be present. Yeah, and then, so Dr. McCoy, you've got a few things that you want to share. Yeah, we talked audience. a little bit about... We talk, yeah, we, talk, we started down this pathway, right? There are no emergencies in a pandemic, so you really need to wear your PPE. And I, I really, I want to share with you just two minutes, a little bit of research that we've done in EMS about how well the PPE works. This is a paper that's out there. It's published. You can take a look. The citation's down at the bottom. We looked at all of our folks and tried to find 
uh, any, uh, any infections with COVID that might have occurred through care of patients. And we really, really struggled to find uh, providers who, uh, who had any sort of infection related to an exposure in the, in the patients that they cared for, which is really reassuring to me. It, it tells me that of the EMS providers that we're putting out there, we're, we're doing a good job at controlling their on-the-job exposures. Now, people do lots of things in their personal lives and can be exposed there. Uh, and there certainly is, you know, we want to be careful with our donning and our doffing. We want to make sure we're wearing the right uh, PPE and that we're doing, we're wearing it in the right way. And all these things are important. But we really, really, uh, we really think that when folks wear their PPE correctly, that they are, that they're well protected. And then we started looking at uh, aerosol generating procedures. This is early, early data. This is not out yet. It is coming soon. To a publication near you, uh, but you know, looking at the highest risk procedures. So these are the folks that are getting intubated. These are the folks that might get a nebulized treatment. These are the folks that might uh, get BiPAP in the pre or CPAP or, pre or BiPAP in the pre-hospital scenario. And we are really, really struggling to find any providers who have a temporal COVID positive result related to their care of a patient who is COVID positive and got an aerosol generating procedure in the pre-hospital environment. Now, how does this directly, how does this correlate to the hospital environment? Uh, you know, we don't know for sure. I think uh, wearing PPE in the hospital is also safe. This reassures me, frankly, when I'm, you know, going to intubate a, a COVID suspected patient in the emergency department that, uh, you know, wearing my PPE is something that protects me and will keep me safe from, from acquiring COVID as safe as possible uh, until we can get the vaccine uh, vaccine up and going and everybody vaccinated in the in the next few weeks. So a lot more to come on this topic, but uh, I think I think that's sort of a highlight that hopefully comforts those of you out there caring for these providers every day, just like uh, just like Nicole and I. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's kind of get back to just resuscitation in general. Um, so minus COVID, but in general, what works? Well, for the community, we are definitely still teaching and advising hands-only CPR. Um, national bystander CPR rates are less than 50%. And I think this is a really important thing to stress, you know, that the public can do hands-only CPR. And some of you, if you've been on a webinar or have um, attended a resuscitation course with me before, a lot of you might know, I a, a year ago, I had to give CPR to a woman who collapsed at CT airport down by the uber and lift weight area and um, and she was doing something that was really interesting so she was doing like an, a, a gasping respiration and, and and I really think this is something that needs to be stressed and in BLS courses to both healthcare providers and the lay public but um, many times when people have a sudden cardiac arrest they can do a gasping respiration and you might look at a patient and say, oh, no, they're, they're breathing, like, you know, maybe they don't need CPR. And I'll have to be really honest, like, um, in the airport, when I saw this woman doing gasping respirations, I couldn't feel a pulse. I had people yelling, no, she's breathing, she's breathing. And I'm like, no, start CPR. And... Um, and, you know, I even started doubting myself. So if you can imagine, like, I teach resuscitation topics, how the lay person might feel if they see a chest moving. And this is something that truly needs to be stressed and talked about. But when patients experience or people experience gasping respirations when they arrest, they have a much higher survival than those who don't have or experience those gasping respirations. And in fact, a lot of 911 dispatchers have been trained uh, to say instead of saying is the patient breathing they'll say are they breathing abnormally and I think that was yep. that was a key recommendation Absolutely. to 911 dispatchers yep, yeah, the and, breathing are they awake are they breathing normally is, is really key and critical to catching these patients right because these 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 agonal respirations these gasping respirations they're not normal breaths they are very abnormal uh, but if you're a lay person who stumbled upon a cardiac arrest patient, uh, happened to call 911, you're like, oh, I, I mean, there's air going in and out, right? They seem like they're breathing. Yeah. Are they breathing normally? And that's really the critical part. And, and then, no, I mean, everybody recognizes that these are not normal respirations. This is not a normal patient. And that allows our call takers to really hone in and say, yep, they need CPR. That's a great point, Nicole. 
Yeah, you know, and in the woman I did CPR on, she continued with the gassing and respirations for I'd say at least thirty plus seconds, you know, into yeah. us doing CPR on her, and um, and I I honestly like even doubted myself, and then at yeah. minute eight when the the AED arrived and it said shock advised, I was a little bit shocked myself to be honest. Yeah. I'm like, okay, she really is arresting, you know. You just you, I just think so many it's, times you second guess yourself. It's a good sign. This is a, yeah. a positive sign. I'm thrilled when they tell me there's agonal respirations on a patient they're bringing it that just makes my day because it means that we have the best chance we can have to try to resuscitate them further and, and have a good outcome so it's awesome yeah and then just to close the loop on uh, the, my story but at uh, minute eight we shot we defibrillated this woman and then um two minutes did two more minutes of cpr and got her pulse back and then um ems um, showed up right at that moment they took over and i called the next day and she actually woke up after we That's left awesome. so yeah Sweet. so yeah, and it was all we did compressions only CPR the entire time. So, um, so what are some ventilation strategies during like what should be your strategy during resuscitation? Well, obviously to maintain oxygenation, we're not really sure exactly what oxygen level is the most optimal. We know hypoxia is bad, and we know hyperoxemia is all is also bad. But um, our goal should be to maintain oxygenation, and of course aid in removal of CT CO2. But with that said, a lot of that CO2 to mobilization will happen with chest compressions, but also it's something that we can tweak and fix once we get the patient resuscitated. Um, a, a request I've gotten more times than I care to admit is um, we'll be in the middle of a cardiac arrest on the in-hospital side, and um, we'll get an, a blood gas, and we'll have a high CO2, and you often we'll hear the request of, to bag faster, and that's actually not what you should do. When you are yep. providing assisted breasts, um, it should be... A, 10 a minute in an adult patient. Um, so that's one breath every six seconds. And yep. you, when you overventilate, we're going to talk about the detriments of overventilation. But it in feels general, slow. It feels so slow, Nicole. <laughs> I can't bag that slow. What, why do you want me to bag so slow? I know. I know it you've is. Chosen a great, you've chosen a great picture. That top picture is amazing. The guy is bagging and he's figured out how to do it without delivering a liter for every ventilation, right? Yes. He's really, he's using a couple <laughs> fingers. He's not bagging with yes. two hands. He's not got the bag in his armpit to squeeze every last CC out of it. He's really <laughs> doing a good job. Yes, and do you all see this pinky lifted? That's that's I I there's uh, Mike Helmbach who it might be on the line. Um, he I always tease him because he does the pinky the pinky lift when he's bagging. Um, but uh, but this this is key. This is what you don't want to do. So you do not want to do the death grip on an Ambu bag and um, and overventilate a patient. So don't do that. Um, what is the optimal tidal volume? I we, I don't think we really know. Um, in general, right now we're saying like five to six mils per kilo, but that would be based on um, predicted or ideal body weight, not on actual body weight. But I, I don't think we really know exactly what the optimal tidal volume is, but your assisted ventilation should be about a second in duration. Um, you know, I always, when I'm live in a class, I'll always uh, do the what you shouldn't do um, type of things. And, um, you know, you shouldn't be uh, Squeeze doing the death grip on a bag and giving too much volume, um, and you shouldn't be uh, giving too many ventilations. There's a lot of detriments when you overventilate. So hyperventilation is you know, breathing or assisting too quickly. Overventilation is with too much volume, and we can cause a lot of problems. But again, we just we still don't know what that optimal tidal volume would be for most, at least adult patients. I think it's a um, great preview of the 2023 version of this talk. So. There's several groups that are trying to research this, figure out that right tidal volume, figure out that ventilation rate, figure out what is the right sort of the airway part and the respiration part and the ventilation part of resuscitation and really dive into that. I think it's the part of resuscitation research that's really been lacking uh, the last 10 or 20 years and is something that a lot of groups are really looking at very, very carefully. And I think you'll see a ton more research come out and hopefully in a couple of years, we can do this whole session again, just on the ventilation part of cardiac arrest. I think it would be fascinating and we'll have a whole lot of research. Yeah, I agree. I think it'd be really exciting to have just better guidance on what to do. Definitely. 
but this is a case from a hospital. Now, every defibrillator on the market has the ability to do post-event review where you can um, wirelessly transmit cases to a software program and take a look. So the little red lines represent a chest compression. The blue triangles represent an assisted ventilation. And you can see in this um, resuscitation, the assisted ventilation rates are just way too fast, 29, 35, 30, 27. You know, and I think it's really tough because in a resuscitation event, everyone's own adrenaline is pumping and, you know, we're like saying, go faster to the compressor, but not too fast, right? So 100, 120 a minute. And, you know, to the, per the poor person assisting giving ventilations, you know, it it's really painfully slow. And when I'm live, and of course, the other thing I'll do is I'll have people hold up two fingers with an opposable thumb and I will put on my stopwatch and I will time out what one breath every six seconds looks and feels like and it is really painfully slow and uh, it, it's, it's actually it's pretty uncomfortable so dr. McCoy this is a you wanted to give another view of yeah so the code step yeah, program. yep exactly so the code set program which is one version of the post event review software can output the the data that Nicole showed but when you start to get more granular and start to look at your cases in greater detail you can get actually waveform uh, level data that is captured by these monitors. And this is a fascinating example, right? Here's a guy who's in a some sort of organized rhythm that goes into what looks like a VTAC, then into maybe even a torsades-ish rhythm that gets less and less organized. And this is all over the course of about 20 seconds, right? And the, uh, the medics on this call appropriately charged and shocked him before they started CPR because it was a very, very fresh arrest and they thought they had a good shot. Um, and then you you see the green waveform at the top is the impedance waveform, so you can start to track your chest compressions. Uh, we've got some CO2 data at the bottom, uh, and we uh, if they're hooked up to SpO2, you'll also get that waveform. So you can review second by second exactly what happened and the decisions that were made in the resuscitation. We layer the audio on top of this, so our uh, our, our particular monitor can record the audio, and you just get this fascinating view in the cardiac resuscitation that. You know, I spent an hour with two crews yesterday going over their resuscitations from last week, and we were able to really pinpoint some uh, critical thinking and, and how we can, uh, you know, what we did well, what we didn't do so well, what we can do even better next time and, and help them with their own performance. It's an awesome tool uh, we should all be taking advantage of. Yeah, no, I agree, because how do you really improve unless you know what you need to improve upon, right? Exactly. I always yep. say there's feelings and then there's facts. <laughs> Definitely. And this these reveal the facts of what happened, you know, during the resuscitation. But what are the detriments of hyper and overventilation? Well, if we hyper or overventilate, it increases the intrathoracic chest pressure, which will decrease venous return, which increases pulmonary vascular resistance, which can then lead to decreased cardiac output and decreased coronary perfusion. And the, the bottom line is it all has a negative impact on CPR quality. So we really do need to get the basics right. So some other long a possible long-term um, effects of hyper over ventilation would be um, vomiting, aspiration, lung trauma, ARDS, and actually, Dr. McCoy, you, uh, you you've been involved peripherally, I believe, with some research in ARDS. ARDS, correct? Yeah, we're really trying to dig into what, you know, ARDS and cardiac arrest, what's the relationship? Uh, are these longer resuscitations, shorter resuscitations? We're starting to try to measure um, both from the CO2 waveform as well as from, uh, you know, other data that, that might be available, uh, any sort of indicators that a patient might go on to develop ARDS, and anything we can do early in the resuscitation to mitigate this, because we know that patients that develop ARDS do worse long term, and we, we're pretty sure that that's related to overventilation, but we don't know how much overventilation it takes. Is it one big breath that is enough to cause ARDS? Probably not. Is it 10 minutes of big breaths? Is it 20 minutes? We don't know. We don't have any idea sort of where that threshold is, and we really want to understand this better. And uh, there's some really awesome folks uh, at Harborview and UW Medicine that are diving into this, and a lot of people across the country and across, around the world because it's an important topic and one that is really coming to the forefront of resuscitation research.
Yeah, and um, you know, an another nice thing, so hopefully most of us are using capnography now during resuscitation, but any device you use, or I should say most devices you use, are going to display the assisted ventilation rate. So, you know, use that to your advantage. And, you know, just speaking of capnography, it is the gold standard. It's a class 1A recommendation to verify endotracheal tube placement. And there's, just, there's so many advantages of capnography. I mean, that's th that could be a whole talk on its own. But I think a big advantage since we're talking about airways is that it will detect endotracheal tube uh, dislodgement, especially in a resuscitation. You'll get basically kind of like a flat line on your capnography. But the other thing is for placement. And um, out of the UK, this I think is back in 2017, they had a few cases of patients who unfortunately had bad outcomes because uh, the patient the endotracheal tube was in an incorrect, uh, had incorrect placement, and their kind of, uh, their uh, motto became, if they're, if there's no trace on capnography, you're in the wrong place. So no trace, wrong place. And capnography is, again, just absolutely essential. If you're not using it, it's probably time to have a discussion um, as to what are the barriers are in your EMS agency or your facility to start using uh, capnography. Now, we're going to dive, in just a few minutes, we're going to dive into all the different airway options during arrest, but we do have a few options, and we do have some new evidence to uh, discuss those options. But one of the questions I always ask is, why has endotracheal tube placement been considered the gold standard? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of advantages of it. Um, it's gonna, it does provide some protection from aspiration. You're not gonna get that um, gastric insufflation um, that can happen when without an endotracheal tube. But um, there's evidence, first of all, that a lot of times patients who have cardiac arrest regurgitate and, and can aspirate before any airway interventions and it's just really difficult to suss out often who those patients are but I think the other challenge to endotracheal tube placement and the reason why uh, there have been some recent studies evaluating this is that studies reveal that over 50 intubations are needed to maintain an insertion success rate of over 90 percent so you know it's a skill if you don't use it you lose it and can be really challenging so we're going to launch a poll. So Tracy's going to chime in and launch a poll here. So we'd love to, we'd love for everybody on the line to vote. But how does your EMS agency or hospital generally manage the airway during resuscitation? So are you mostly placing endotracheal tubes as your first choice? Um, is the placement of a supraglottic uh, airway common? Or are you using bag valve mask until you get ROSC and then placing an endotracheal tube, play, uh, tube once the patient is stable? And sorry, we ran out of characters on the end of this. We really do know how to spell. <laughs> so, so get your votes in and let us know what is your EMS agency or hospital generally doing to manage airways during resuscitation? All right, Tracy, do you see some votes rolling in? We do, Nicole. I think we still need a few more minutes. Everyone, you can just vote uh, or directly on your monitor to select the appropriate response. Thanks. All right. So we, I'm, I'm excited to see what you all say. So how does it? How do you? How does your EMS agency or hospital? manage airways. And Dr. McCoy, um, after this, is going to really dive in. We're going to do it. We're going to uh, dive in. Absolutely. Okay. So it looks like most of you are uh, placing endotracheal tubes as your first choice. Um, oh, look at this. It's like a dead heat between yeah. superglottic airways and BVM. I, this is super, super interesting. No, okay. I think it's really, it's reflective of the practice that's actually out there, right? And and yeah. this is variable, this is an open question. We're going to go through some research, and and I think the takeaway at the end of the research, I hope for you, will be that this is still an open question. This is an area that we need to do more research in, that we need to continue looking at, and we really need to, to dive into as sort of resuscitation researchers and uh, really a, a critical part of, of what we do. Um, let's... Keep going here. Perfect. Uh, so this is the question, right? So tracheal intubation, endotracheal intubation with an endotracheal tube or a laryngeal airway for your patient in uh, in arrest. And one of the one of the 
better looks at this really came out of the Get With The Guidelines data, where they looked at thousands and thousands of arrests in hospital arrests uh, that were in the Get With The Guidelines database and uh, compared advanced airway placement in the first 15 minutes compared to no intubation. So this is our choice A versus choice C, right? And I think Nicole's gonna walk us through the yeah. data a little bit here. Yeah, no, this was really interesting. So what they did was, um, like you said, if, if as long as they had an open airway and they were able to ventilate, they randomized patients to either get BVM assisted ventilations or to have an endotracheal tube placed in the first 15 minutes. And so what they did in this, I, I have to say, this is a really difficult study to, um, yeah. to, to do, but they looked at shockable versus non-shockable rhythms. They evaluated when the patient um, had an advanced airway place, was it like minute zero to 14? So if you look over um, on the left, you can see time of matching, zero to four minutes, five to seven, nine minutes, and then 10 to 15 minutes, and then looked at the type of patient. So is there a difference if I place an endotracheal tube versus just BVM, uh, use a bag valve mask, if it's a medical cardiac patient, a medical non-cardiac patient, surgical patient. Then they also evaluated if it's a respiratory arrest, does it make a difference? Um, does it make a difference where the patient's located in the emergency department versus a acute care unit versus the ICU? And um, so what I'm about to pop, or actually Dr. McCoy is about to yeah. reveal, is um, this is a forest plot. And um, so can you just click to the right? And so this is what we call the reference line. And what you're gonna see pop up are what are known as confidence intervals. And so if the confidence intervals, well, you're gonna see like a dot with what I, we always jokingly call them whiskers. If they fall to the left of that reference line, that favors no intubation. Um, so that would favor bag valve mask as long as, you know, keeping the airway open. If the confidence intervals fall to the right, that favors intubation in the first 15 minutes. So I want everybody right now, think to yourself, which way do you think this data is going to go? Is it going to favor, and this now this is in hospitalized patients, is it going to favor intubation, the confidence intervals will fall to the right, or bag valve mask where the, the confidence intervals will fall to the left. So, so vote in your head right now. What do you think? All right, now let's reveal what the study showed. The study demonstrated that it favors no intubation as long as you were able to bag valve mask patients, which I think is, these are quite stunning. Um, this is quite a stunning revelation. Yeah. So why would this be? I don't know, like if I had to guess, like why would this favor no intubation? I think this has a lot to do with the pauses that we take around intubation pauses in CPR. So uh, now I will say there were some limitations to this study. Um, so they weren't able to correct for other like confounding factors. So for example, they didn't measure CPR quality, experience of providers placing uh, uh, tubes, um, the cause of the arrest or the indication for intubation. So you, I think this what this does is this gives us a signal that really says, you know what, we probably should really look at this in a proper yeah randomized control trial and control for all of these confounding factors. Right, because remember this is a retrospective look at data that's collected mm -hmm. for a guidelines database, right? So we're not randomizing folks to one or the other. This is what did the patient actually get? And so you totally get confounding by cause, right? The indication for intubation or the indication for airway management is gonna be very, very variable and, uh, and a little bit subjective rather than sort of randomizing. And we will get to how you would randomize somebody for a trial like this in just a minute. Yeah, which I I truly feel needs to be done in the in-hospital cardiac yeah, arrest absolutely. patient population. So, okay, so I'm going to show you if we can advance. Uh, this is a case. Um, I've shown this case before, but I, I just think this is really, uh, this is, again, this is that post-arrest um, review. This was from CodeStat. And Andy, if you just go ahead and um, advance. Boy, anybody who looks at CodeStat should automatically have the hairs on the back of their neck yes. for this case. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, so what you can see is the first... Um, um, if you look at the top, come down. Remember, the red dashes represent chest compressions. The blue circle represents, um, so if we go to the right, that's the rhythm. The patient's in V-fib. So the patient got shocked. You can see the little, um, if you go back to the left, you can see the little, like, lightning bolt. They got shocked. And then they didn't get shocked, or uh, there was not a, a, a break to assess the rhythm until minute seven, where they got shocked again. So they, uh, so six minutes transpired in between shocks. And then look at what happened at minute, like uh, 13 to minute, what is that? 
almost 16 and a half yeah 16 yeah they took a two minute 42 second pause and so why do you think that pause was taken so dr mccoy why if you had to guess why do you think that pause was taken uh uh my best guess would be for airway management yeah, it was for intubation. Yeah, and yeah. I think time can pass vo both quickly and slowly during resuscitations. And, yep. you know, if you were to go back to this team and say, hey, did you realize we were off the chest for two minutes, 42 seconds to intubate? You know, it probably didn't no feel idea. like it was that long. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And they so, no and if you yeah, ask them, should they take a pause that. that long? They would say, no, we we would never take a pause that long, right? Because no, yeah. nobody wants to do this. It just happens. And so we really have to strategize around it. Yeah, and just remember, there are facts and there are feelings. And this shows us the facts of what happened uh, during this resuscitation. So, okay, back over to you, Dr. McCoy. All right, this is my favorite part of the 2020 guidelines. Uh, really, really cool. They call it the airway schema. And, and I think it's really, really, really smart. Uh, so we sort of break down patients in cardiac arrest uh, in any setting. Do they need an advanced airway? Well, I say almost all need an advanced airway. Uh, you have these one shock wonders who do awesome and wake up and talk, but they are rare. Uh, so in the hospital, we have expert providers trained in advanced airway procedures we recommend either supraglottic or endotracheal tube because there is some clinical equipoise between these two depending on on what exactly the situation is and who's present at the arrest in the out hospital setting which is kind of where i specialize in, and i what i think is fascinating about this right if you are an agency that has low tracheal intubation success rate or minimal training opportunities. You're an agency that is low resourced, you have a lot of volunteer providers, you have folks that are really pushed and don't have a lot of time for training. This is very, very common. Uh, then a supraglottic airway may be your best option. And if you are an agency that has time, has resources, has money, is able to train at a higher level and has a high tracheal intubation success rate, uh, maybe it's reasonable to use an endotracheal tube first. Uh, either a supraglottic or an endotracheal tube can be used in the setting. So this dichotomy here is really, really important. And kind of where does this come from is, is really an interesting question that, that I kind of want to dive into a little bit. So two randomized trials published last year, uh, uh, 2019, both fascinating, really excellent work, really awesome dive into the data. The first is the, uh, the PART trial. This is a uh, trial uh, that looked mostly at data that was collected uh, in the ROC consortium. So those of you that are familiar with pre-hospital cardiac arrest research or will be very familiar with the resuscitation outcomes consortium. Uh, and this looked at uh, some of the data related to survival based on the airway that a patient received, laryngeal tube versus endotracheal intubation pre-hospital cardiac arrest. Second trial published very similar time, conducted over a similar period of time, was where folks randomized one-to-one -one to endotracheal intubation or a supraglottic airway. And this was done in several dis different systems in England. And we're gonna, we're gonna highlight that one, I think, uh, as an example. There were actually three or four trials that all came out about the same time that all were very, very well done, very well conducted, and all had, uh, my interpretation is similar results that we'll talk about in a second here. So this study, Airways 2, looked at endotracheal placement, Good friend of mine, John Wall, intubating uh, in a training scenario here, uh, and IGEL LMA placement uh, randomized to one or the other, each of the patients. They used four large ambulance trusts, which are very large ambulance systems uh, in England uh, that totaled an area that covered 21 million lives. So big EMS uh, coverage area, lots of, uh, lots of data here. We looked, uh, they randomized the paramedics to airway. Right, and so they they took each paramedic and said, "You are an endotracheal paramedic. Here's your training. Here is your equipment. You know what you're going to do. Uh, or you are a paramedic who's going to do supraglottic airways. Here's what you're going to do. This is a very pragmatic way to do it. This works really, really well. The paramedic knows what they're going to do. They're not opening an envelope 10 seconds before the tube. They know when I go on a cardiac arrest, I'm going to intubate." When I go on a cardiac arrest, I'm going to place a supraglottic airway. And so they are ready and prepared to do their task and achieve it at a high level. Um, they attended a, a very fair amount of cases uh, over the couple years, right? Five to six cardiac arrests managed with an airway over two years is really a good number. Uh, and, and they managed, uh, managed them well. We've got large numbers of patients here, 12,000 in the endotracheal intubation, 13,000 in the supraglottic airway device. 
uh, resuscitation was not attempted in an appropriate percentage of these, right, for all of the reasons that, that one would expect. Uh, they had uh, patient's decision or some pulsed form type activity. They had signs of rigor. Uh, it was a futile effort. Uh, all these sorts of things that are, are sort of our standard criteria for not starting resuscitation. Um, and then they excluded patients uh, for, for all the appropriate reasons. Pediatric patients were excluded, uh, prisoners or detained by Her Majesty's prison service were excluded uh, very appropriately as, as we commonly do in research. Um, they didn't really lose very many uh, to, to trial and, and so to, uh, to follow up. So because they're cardiac arrest patients, it's fairly easy to follow them up. Uh, the vast majority end in the hospital. Uh, but what they found, those that were randomized the endotracheal intubation group, 62% of them got endotracheal intubation as their final airway. Some had to have rescue bag valve mask. Some had to have a rescue supraglottic airway. Of those in the supraglottic device, 83% were able to achieve a supraglottic placement. 15% needed rescue BVM as they struggled with the supraglottic airway. 2% received endotracheal intubation for uh, various uh, reasons that uh, they highlight in their paper, but we won't go through for lack of time. They did an amazing dive into the data and an amazing report, right? So how are these folks doing when they when they leave the hospital? What are the outcomes? What are the things that we are interested in? Uh, if you dive into this, you can really see uh, with each group, how did folks do and how were they done? How how did uh, how did things end up? We're going to go into sort of the the higher level view, right? So these are modified Rankin scores for folks who were in the tracheal intubation group, folks that were in the supraglottic airway group. We look at the p-value. We see no significant difference. We see a uh, confidence interval that crosses zero. No significant difference in that group. So no big difference between an intention to intubate when you show up on the scene of a cardiac arrest and an intention to place a supraglottic airway when you show up on a cardiac arrest. Really, really interesting data. This is a really rigorous way to look at it across tens of thousands of patients trying to find a signal that one might be better than the other, that one strategy might be better than the other. So a large, well-done study of a very tough topic, very difficult thing to study. No major difference between LMA and intubation. Early, placed early in the resuscitation. And there are several similar papers that I think are also reasonably neutral and really get back to this airway schema. If you do intubation well, and you have opportunities to train on it, it's reasonable to intubate. If you don't have training opportunities, if you don't do it very often, if you're not very good at it, you probably shouldn't be doing it. You probably should place a supraglottic airway and that's a reasonable thing for your patient and might be the right thing for your system. Really have to evaluate critically your system, figure out what you're good at, what you're not good at, and what is gonna give your patient the best outcome for their arrest. And down here at the bottom, this little caveat, frequent experience or frequent retraining, and I think that should be an and in the middle there, frequent experience and frequent retraining is recommended for providers who perform endotracheal intubation. Really, really critical. We spend lots and lots and lots of time working on this with my providers and it pays dividends, right? These folks, uh, I feel comfortable letting them intubate me if I had a cardiac arrest. And, and that's uh, a really a, a badge of honor that I'm able to say that about my crews. All right, I want to show you two quick examples. I slipped this in on Nicole. She knows a little bit about it, but I'm going to tell you some really cool stuff that I think is the future of, uh, of airway management and little simple interventions that can make a difference. Uh, we're going to talk about bougie placement. This works during cardiac arrest. We're going to talk about bed up head elevated positioning, which is not able to be done uh, intra arrest for obvious reasons uh, with the current technology, uh, but is an interesting strategy. So the first sort of, uh, one of the first hints of this and one of a really well done paper is looking at bougie use and first pass success and really finds that when you use a bougie to intubate, right, a, a rigid uh, long stylet with a coup de tip, you see increased first pass success. You see decreased decreased problems uh, around your airway. Really, really, really interesting stuff. This is the in-hospital data looking at in the emergency department, uh, not necessarily cardiac arrest. Uh, I believe that they included cardiac arrest, but they did not solely study cardiac arrest. They also looked at other causes and etiologies of airway, requiring airway management. We, uh, our group in Seattle has started to look at this pre-hospital. This is the first presentation of the data that was last year at NAEMSP. Uh, there is a publication that is uh, sort of in process. Uh, we know that intubating folks who are in arrest is more difficult. Uh, we know that intubating folks who have a pulse is simpler. We find that those who used a bougie 
uh, really had higher success rates than those who didn't have a bougie applied. First attempt success with a bougie is 86%. First attempt success without a bougie is 77%, 12% difference, pretty big. Similar difference in uh, the patient who is in cardiac arrest at the time of, of airway management, about a 10% bump. Uh, so we found uh, that routine use of the bougie increases first pass endotracheal success, reduces the number of attempts, and uh, really is a, a reasonable strategy that results in, in folks getting really good at using the bougie. Um, and, and we found that they did what they said they were setting out to do, right? They used the bougie in the bougie period and they didn't use the bougie in the control period um, pretty, pretty regularly. So we think this is a, a very interesting and compelling strategy. I'm gonna talk about one more strategy here real quick. Uh, this is in hospital, right? Intubation, not necessarily in cardiac arrest, actually not in cardiac arrest. They were excluded if they were in cardiac arrest because we don't standardly put folks with their head up in hospital in cardiac arrest. Um, this looked at 500 patients who were managed either supine or in the head up positioning and found back up head elevated position uh, compared with supine position decreased the odds of an airway related complication, decreased hypoxia, decreased requiring more than one uh, more than one try at their intubation, decreased their aspiration, decreased all the things that we want to decrease in these patients, really was an interesting study. We repeated the same study with our pre-hospital data, really fascinating, found the same thing. Inclined positioning, putting the, the head up, uh, gives us a better grade of view at the first uh, attempt, a higher rate of first pass success, and fewer of these complications of intubation. Really, really important stuff here for those of you that manage airways a lot. I think this, you know, the way I think about it, instead of line supine and all of your redundant soft tissue falls straight back onto your airway in your throat, this sort of allows gravity to do its thing and that redundant soft tissue kind of falls down a little bit more, less onto your airway and, and folks are able to manage that airway much easier and, and the patient, uh, in a patient-centered way, they're able to get intubated better. Really, really, really important. All right, we're at the awesome hour where we do our take-home points and get to your questions. Nicole and I are super excited about this. Uh, we really feel it's important that you protect yourself. This this age and era of COVID-19 is with us. It'll be with us for a while longer. Uh, it is important to protect yourself and wear your PPE. It protects you and it keeps you safe. Minimize your pauses especially around airway placement, right? Uh, place your airway, place your supraglottic tube, place your endotracheal tube with ongoing compressions whenever possible. Minimize your pauses if you have to pause. Really, really, really important stuff here. We know the data behind this is sound, it is solid. This results in more survivors when you can do it with compressions ongoing in, a, in an effective way. Watch your ventilation, make sure you're not overventilating. We know that overventilation has numerous detrimental physiologic effects and really is uh, is, is to be avoided in, in patient care. Uh, capnography post-event review is critical. It's, it's really critical. The EMS guys have jumped on this. Uh, it's growing, spreading across EMS agencies across the country. Hospitals are dipping their toes in it. They are learning the power of post-event review, the power of reviewing the waveform data, the power of reviewing recordings of resuscitations and helping crews get better and do an even better job on the next one. It's not about punishing folks for what they did wrong. It's about doing a better job on the next patient. Really, really critical stuff. And the type of airway placed, right? This airway schema, the one you are efficient at, the one you are proficient at is the one you should be placing, right? Really critical stuff here, really important stuff, really awesome look at airway and, and resuscitation and how airway interacts with resuscitation. Uh, we put our contact information in here. If you have anything, uh, any, any burning questions that don't get answered in the next question and answer session, Nicole and I are both happy to, to take any questions. Uh, we both put a lot of content out there and, and really enjoy teaching and sharing stuff with our crowds and, and our friends that, that attend our webinars and listen in. And uh, I hope it's been a fun and exciting day for you. Um, I think that concludes our prepared slides. I'm really excited to get to questions. Uh, before we begin the question period, James is going to jump back in and let all you know how you can get your CE for attending today. Thank you so much, Dr. McCoy um, and Nicole. Wow, that was a lot <laughs> and amazing, like a lot in a very, very good way. And you have about 7 trillion questions to answer here in the next, uh, what do we have? about 12 minutes to answer those questions. So we're going to try to breeze through them. Before we get to those questions, I know everyone's chomping at the bit for your answers. 
Uh, a few more particulars. So of course, continuing education for nurses, EMS and respiratory therapists is available for this session. It's one contact hour. How do you get it? So you go to www.saxtesting.com slash SL. That's S-A-X-E testing.com slash SL. So write that down, take a picture of the screen, whatever you need to do. Once you get there, you'll need to register on that site and complete an evaluation form. Once that's done, once you've submitted that, nurses and RTs will be able to print your certificate at that time. Our EMS folks who are on your certificate will be emailed to you, okay? So, saxtesting.com slash SL for your CE. And of course, we would be remiss if we did not thank Stryker again for support of this educational activity. All right, there's an archived version of this, which is great. So if you missed anything or you came in at the end or you wanna go back and review, whatever, you can do that. It will be available at savinglivesnow.org, savinglivesnow.org. An email is gonna be sent to all of the registrants uh, when that archive version is available. And this archive on-demand version is accredited for nurses, EMS, and respiratory therapists to also get your CE with that, all right? So now we get to the questions. This is the fun part. I'm gonna start with bougies. There are a lot of questions about this from front to back. So some folks were saying, what is a bougie? I've never heard of this, or oh, yeah. we, just, we just got them. I don't know how to use it. Does this in particular, sort of a, an, an order of intubation, right? Bougie, ET tube, et cetera, that sort of thing. So can uh, either or both of you spend a little bit of time, kind of give us a 360 of bougie. We'll start. Yeah, there. I'd love to. Yeah, I sort of skipped right through this. Uh, so bougies are the the long blue stick that you see. It's got a coude tip, like a coude catheter. So it's sort of bent. The idea here is that it's flexible, but rigid. So you can use this small device, sort of skinny device to uh your laryngoscope is in the mouth you go in you can uh guide your bougie into the airway uh the coude tip helps you feel the tracheal rings to know that you're in the airway versus the esophagus and then you can advance your endotracheal tube over the top of the bougie there's other names for bougie the eschman catheter is one as it was invented by a dr eschman i hate things that are named after the person that invented them because they're terrible to remember but the the gum elastic bougie the bougie is another copy common name they're standardly blue but they also come in different colors so you may not uh, have blue in your hospital I've seen yellow and tan before they are awesome devices uh, traditionally they're taped on the wall of the resuscitation room and you have to rip it down to get it if you need it we're really trying to change that culture because I think there's really uh, uh, pretty good evidence that when you use it a lot you get better at it you become better at using the tool and you are more able to use it when you absolutely have to use it to, to sort of save a life and, and get that airway that you need now. It's a really great tool that I think can be a, a tremendous adjunct in your, your airway management strategy. I was just looking to see if I had a picture of a bougie to do a post on it today. And I have a video of us using one, but um, maybe I'll make a post on something with airways today. Okay, awesome. On Instagram, yeah, I'll do it on Instagram, so. Perfect. Yeah, All but, right. But I think, yeah, it, but it is. So, Dr. McCoy, there's just one yeah. thing I want to ask you. So, so with the literature that's coming out related to like heads up, less complications, how can you see that melding with resuscitation? Yeah, so it's a fascinating question. So, uh, and some of you may have heard of this concept called heads up CPR that is sort of floating around out there and is in the, the early days uh, where uh, there's a, a device that is on the market now that. Uh, lifts the head and the thorax of the patient uh, slightly. Um, you're supposed to do this after you intubate them or after you place the definitive airway is my understanding. Uh, lift the head of the thorax slightly and change the hemodynamics uh, pretty, pretty uh, if, if uh, you believe the, the limited data that's out there pretty dramatically in, uh, in patients who, who it's done to. Uh, so I don't know how that will affect intubation. Should we raise their head and their chest and then try to intubate them? I think is a question nobody knows the answer to. The standard recommendation right now is to place that tube before you do any sort of heads up positioning. Um, in cardiac arrest. In a patient who's not in arrest or not yet in arrest, placing them in a heads-up position has pretty clear evidence that uh, that we have some benefit. So it's a it's a tricky mix. Uh, anytime you, you do something in resuscitation research, you want to make sure you don't break what works, right? And we yeah. know that good CPR works really, really well, so we don't want to break that. 
we don't want to break the BLS to do an ALS procedure. We really want to focus around the things that we know work, shocks, good compressions, good rates, good ventilations, all the things that are, are key and critical to BLS resusc resuscitation. And I think that's a super good differentiator to make because you're like, how does this all work together? So um, I love that you just like differentiate yeah. all that. We just don't know yet, right? Yeah, like, we don't know. There's a know. lot lot of learning to happen, a lot yeah. of learning to happen. Very good. Just on, on top of that, there were a couple of questions about what degree of incline for intubation would you suggest, like a, a specific degree? Yeah, we do about 30 degrees uh, whenever I'm intubating someone with a resident in the hospital. I work at a teaching hospital, so I, I take a lot of trainees through these procedures. Uh, and we are, we're, you know, if, if this is flat, we're at about 30 degrees like this. And you see a difference in sort of the patient positioning. You see sort of the soft tissue instead of falling straight back, you see it sort of dropping down a little bit and your, your airway opens up very nicely. It's a pretty tremendous intervention that is so simple, especially in the hospital right because they're usually on a bed that bed usually goes up and down pre-hospital it's way more difficult we got to get couch cushions and blankets and pillows and stack them up and then drag the patient and lay them on tight it's a whole ordeal in the hospital right the bed goes up and there we go we're in the right position it's awesome uh, i've had a couple of our shorter residents like stand on top of the bed to to get at the right angle for the airway and they they feel like heroes they love it they get the tube on the first pass and it's awesome so there's really uh i think that 30 degree is sort of where we're looking at with the head and the and the chest sort of elevated a little bit now we're gonna have to put like ladders on our crash carts. <laughs> <laughs> adding, not adding yet. Remember, more this is course. not in cardiac arrest. We want them flat for cardiac arrest because we can do our best resuscitation flat exactly. right now, as far as we know. Perfect. Thank you Great. for that differentiator again. Differentiator, yes. yes. Sorry yes. to yes. everybody. It's it's yeah. It's but it's an important important point. Very good. So a little bit of pathophysiology, if you can do this one fairly quickly. Um, I, I enjoyed this question though, because there were several sort of iterations of this one. Since hypoventilation and hypoxia cause pulmonary vasoconstriction, why would over or hyperventilation cause an increased pulmonary vascular resistance? Is that too much pathophysiology? Was that too much right I was trying to let Nicole, I was going to let Nicole jump in if she wanted to. No, it's, know, so, this, it's, yeah. so well, here's the reality, right? Is that the, the, when you lose your pulse, everything we know about physiology goes out the window, right? Physiology is totally different in the pulseless patient. It's why things that work in patients with a pulse seem to not work in cardiac arrest, right? It's why things that don't work in patients with a pulse work in patients with cardiac arrest. All of your hemodynamics change. So what we know is that intrathoracic pressure is really, really important in the patient who is in arrest, right? And if you're ventilating and you're using, you're filling that entire chest up with airway, not allowing sort of complete relaxation, you probably have some detrimental effects on flow, whether it's re venous return to the heart to be able to be compressed on the next chest compression, or if it's you know the ability of the heart to fill or the ability of the heart to actually expel blood uh, forward and, and sort of scatter that oxygen through the body. We know that, uh, that those hemodynamics change based on, on ventilations. And, and we think that the, the more you ventilate, uh, more than is necessary to maintain normal CO2 and more than is necessary to maintain normal oxygen. But if you're ventilating beyond that point, we think you're probably starting to cause harm. And it's probably related to intrathoracic pressure in addition to some lots of other sort of complicated mechanisms, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other really physiologically the other tough thing that happens is a lot of time there's blood backing up into the right side of the heart. And that just changes the dynamic of left versus right heart. Yeah. And, you know, and then, I mean, there's, this is like a whole other talk is, you know, is being right on top of the sternum, the right place to oh, compress, talk, to right? get so, blood from the right to the left. Love this topic. So folks putting TEE probes, transesophageal yeah. echo probes down intra arrest, right, are finding fascinating things. This is mm -hmm. a fascinating area of research. They're finding, you know, patients that have VF that you can't see on the monitor, but you can see when you're looking at the heart with a TEE probe and they're able to shock it and convert that heart, even though on the monitor it looked like complete asystole, fascinating. They're seeing folks doing compressions in the standard AHA place and we find that they're actually compressing the outflow tract to the heart and so your compression is not effective. They move the hands, you know, two centimeters this way or that way and they're able to get effective compressions. There is way more, we think we yeah. understand the risk, cardiac arrest resuscitation. We are like <laughs> barely scratching the surface of this iceberg. There's so, so much true. more that we're gonna learn in the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. It's just a fascinating field, fascinating stuff. The, the interaction between 
airway management, ventilation, and cardiac arrest is a fascinating area that is just exploding and, and will continue to explode over the next few years. Yeah. So we just have uh, time for one or two quick ones. So I'll give you a couple of quick ones here. I, I really like this question. This is one of those, on paper, it feels like either or, but in a real life scenario, it's maybe different. So uh, this is around ETCO2. So 35 to 45 being ideal. Do you suggest trying to meet this mark? or concentrating on 10 breaths per minute using the ETCO2 simply for ET tube placement? Yeah, well, I mean, just to be super clear, a 35 to 45 is a normal end tidal CO2 in somebody who's got a pulse, like you or I, right? It's normal yep. in us. It's yep. not normal in a patient who's in arrest. Um, you know, in arrest, you're going to have VQ mismatching and your end tidal will be low until you, you know, again, start circulating that blood. So, no, I like, I'm, and, uh, Dr. McCoy, like, to say Ooh. this, if you would disagree no, with I me. Totally speak up but in it in during the arrest is not the time to try to normalize an end tidal co2 end tidal oh. co2 it's actually I mean, in fact, well i mean no i'm sorry a pacco2 the pacco2 yeah, yeah. so it, it, which we measure with end tidal co2 right so i, I think you're you're absolutely correct so yeah. what we don't want to do right so the body has this tremendous capacity to buffer and co2 is part of that buffer co2 right and and it just we can it's amazing to me it's constantly amazing how well the body can buffer co2 patients come in with this super high co2 level we ventilate it off of them once they have a pulse again and they do great right it really has has no harmful effects for a short period of time if their co2 is really high for days and days and days then we start to have problems but over a short period of time we really have a tremendous ability to buffer that what we teach our crews is to really focus on respiratory rates and, and interacting yeah. with CPR in a way that doesn't uh, sort of hemodynamically have any adverse effects. The other part of sort of keeping your ventilation consistent is you can look at that end tidal CO2 as a, uh, an indicator that maybe you have a pulse, right? So your ventilation has stayed exactly yeah. the same, right? You've done your 10 breaths a minute, and now your end tidal CO2 has gone from 20 to 40 since the last pulse check. Mm -hmm. I bet you've got a pulse on this pulse check, right? Yeah. I, yeah. You better start thinking about what you're going to do next, right? Getting that yeah. 12 lead, figuring out do we need to go to the cath lab, getting the presser started, whatever that next thing is for this patient, really, because I think you're going to have a pulse at the next pulse check. So but I want to be varying, super clear. <laughs> you're right, right? If you're, yeah. you're missing, you're going to miss out on that key indicator. Yeah, do not alter the rate to, yep. to alter the PACO2 or the end title. Not in arrest. Keep yeah, leave it, do leave not it alter, yeah. Love it. I think that's a fantastic place. Unfortunately, that we have to stop. There are so many more questions. I'm sorry we were not able to get to them, but everyone is very excited. Everyone's also very excited about how excited the two of you are and have been about this whole thing. It really, it really is quite infectious. So everyone, thank you so much for watching. We very much appreciate it and your questions. Don't forget um, Saks testing as well as savinglives.now.com uh, uh, for more. Tracy? Uh, thanks, James, and thanks to both our speakers for today's such an engaging presentation. We'd also like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. A reminder, there will be a survey uh, immediately upon the conclusion of this webinar. You will be presented with an online survey. Please keep your web browser open, and we appreciate your feedback, as well as a CE certificate of completion. In one hour following the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an email with instructions in this link to obtain your CE credits credits at www.saxtesting.com slash sl and again we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's session as well as our speakers and the many people in our audience today and this concludes our presentation thank you